Alright, look, look, it's the end of the day, but I've been up since 7 a.m. Y'all gotta give us more energy. <laughs> Hello! 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 This is something new that we're doing because this is only the second time that PAX has had the PTI, which is PAX Together Intersection, in case anyone is wondering what is a PTI. Um, and it's a new program for PAX to, to highlight people of color in the teach RPG industry, but also in games, to show that yes, we're here, we belong, and that we are making the games that you make. So we ain't going nowhere. Pay attention to these folks that are here. And uh, I'm excited because everyone on the panel is my friend. And um, we get to sit and chat for about an hour about what this means for you. Um, you know, have you been coming to PAX before? What you do in the PTRPG space? So, I'm going to start with Brian. If you want to introduce yourself, all the faces turn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, Brian. Hi, uh, I'm Brian. Uh, you may have seen me um, talking right here in front of you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am loopy. It's, it's definitely late on the first day. Uh, I am online as Urban Bohemian. I play TTRPGs. I stream video games. I have been blogging since well before blogs existed and cook a lot. And my brain is running out of things to say. <laughs> but I'm very happy to, it's really cool to, to be a PTI fellow this year. It's, it's kind of dope. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. I'm Eugenio Vargas. I'm on the internet as DM Jazzy Hands. Um, I sort of entered the gaming space and the tabletop space back in 2017. I started a DMD podcast when that was all the rage. Still is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sort of found my way to connections in the industry through Origins Game Fair and Pax Unplugged. Um, met some awesome people and since then have done uh, actual play streams, gotten to do things uh, with Wizards of the Coast and D&D. We were both <coughs> Tanya members at some point or another of the Rivals of Waterdeep. Um, I worked on Into the Motherlands, which is a unique uh, and original system. I've done a bunch of other stuff. My podcast ran for five and a half years. Uh, and we put that to bed last March, but that was a really exciting time. And then in the last couple of years, I've moved more into writing and development. Um, primarily, well, primarily, I think a little bit of everything, really. Uh, mm -hmm. Mechanics design and lore and narrative design. I've gotten to write for MCDM Productions uh, and some of their stuff, The Immortals and Where Evil Lives. I've gotten to write for Wizards of the Coast. Uh, I put a couple of entries in the Draconomicon in Fizzman's Treasury of Dragons uh, and have something else coming up. Uh, I don't know when it's going to be released, a couple of years of this, right? But you'll see more from there. I've uh, gotten to write for Darrington Press and for Green Ranine and that's been a nice transition, actually, in the last few years. It's been pretty great. If you like that Moonstone Dragon, that was... My babies. <laughs> 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 oh, thanks. I also did the Sapphire, but, and yeah. I love them too, but yeah. my Moonstones are my babies. <laughs> <laughs> Moonstones are for the gays. <laughs> That's what I hear. That's what I hear. Uh, I'm Cassie. Um, I am kind of the odd person out. I am a mental health professional, uh, licensed clinical social worker, trauma therapist, uh, but I also do game stuff both in uh, my therapeutic practice as well as in my um, activism. I also created uh, in Chicago Black Liberation Play Day, which is an event um, series that is using games um, for liberation uh, on the south side of Chicago. Uh, I also helped uh, with Motherlands. Okay. Um, yeah, well, maybe we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, and I am the clinical program manager. <laughs> titles are really important. Yeah. I hate titles. Uh, so I'm the clinical program manager for uh, Take This uh, as well. Did the uh, Names are leaving my head. It's been a long day. Uh, identity and gaming mental health series, and uh, working on some additional stuff now. And this is actually my first time at PAX. <laughs> so, so that's exciting. I'm sure I'm leaving stuff out because I do an impossible amount of things. But uh, yeah. Oh, my pronouns are they them. Uh, so yeah, happy to be here. 
Uh, hi, I'm Farron Bailey, uh, known as Fair Bear. Um, I'm the only person ever who did not help on Motherlands. That <laughs> 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 just moral support. So no, I, yeah, I'm the um, yeah, I'm here for moral support, honestly. Um, uh, I have, honestly have not been in the TTRPG space that long. I started playing games, I think maybe in like 2018, 2019, and then the pandemic hit, and so it was like, what else is there to do? But start a Discord group with friends, and um, doing that sort of led me into listening to actual plays and watching actual plays, which led me to Rivals of Waterdeep, which then led me to Tanya, and the rest is kind of history. Um, I, I, I stopped you is what I'm saying. No, no, no I didn't. No, I did not really. No. I would never do that. No, but I'm like, you need to have stairs. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, my, I'm, my ass is beat already. Um, no, I did not. I did not stop Tanya. But listening to Rivals of Waterdeep, um, kind of a lot like what PTI is doing, helped me see myself, visualize myself doing more than just playing at a table with friends and playing online with friends. Like I could actually, it inspired me to that somebody who looks like me could also be in this space. And so that kind of led me into going on to Twitch and starting to interact with people. That's when how I learned that you streamed, Tanya. And then from there, just sort of like, I've had so many opportunities uh, given to me, like people offering me to uh, be on actual plays and, and doing charity stuff. And this is actually also my first PAX. And so yeah. it's just been kind of been like a, it's been a wild ride. Um, yeah, I still to this day, even now, I'm like, I don't know how I got here, but I'm happy with it. <laughs> you know? All right, so I'm going to fuss at you. You're going to fuss at me? Yes, you. Okay. Yeah. Because you said people gave you, you earned those opportunities. Mm -hmm. That's true. You're right. I did earn those opportunities. Um, also, can I fuss at you? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? You're getting it from me. Okay. How about, how about this? I will stand in the middle of the room no, and everyone no. can do a line of fussing. But also, okay. maybe. So, <laughs> so you, for, you, for, you forgot your current actual play uh, credit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm cast member for Amastrana, which is a homebrew D&D 5e campaign, which, which uh, Cassie does, um... Evil things! That does... They don't know about. ...consult on, <laughs> so... <laughs> I know about some... I can tell when you put your stamp on things, okay? I can tell. <laughs> because you are evil in a great way. I love you. Um, and then I... am evil, I'm gonna cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love you, too. So... <laughs> Oh, I guess I should say who I am. You all are here for them, not, you know. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, Look, I'm just here. I, what did Dr. Just say? I'm professionally around. That's what I do. <laughs> uh, but I'm Tanya Cyclotier. I was the PTI fellow at PAX West, and I do a whole lot of stuff. Not a lot of it's TGRPG related at this time, but I was on Rivals with Brian Eugenio and Into the Motherlands, and uh, I've consulted with a lot of companies, Moronin, Wizards, Paizo, um, and I'm a big old nerd, and I would like to get back to rolling dice at some point when day job gives me some modicum of free time again. Um, but until then, there's Baldur's Gate. <laughs> <laughs> Forever. Forever and ever. Look, I can play that game a little too easily right now. Um, but, you know, that said, I want to talk about the importance of us being visible. And by us, I mean people of color, folks who are out and queer. Um, wow, the word I wanted just left my brain because it's been a long day. Basically, how important is it for you and what have been kind of the ways in which you've seen the landscape change from whenever you started, your actual play, your podcast, um, from starting at that point up to where we have a program like this, yeah. and they're, you're being highlighted for your work in teach RPGs, no matter what form that takes. I would <laughs> not, I mean, I, haven't, I started playing teach RPGs in, is there, do they, were we even measuring years back then? Like, I'm, I'm still not yeah, measuring like, years. Like, <laughs> late 70s, happens. early 80s. Um, sorry, the late 1900s. <laughs> <laughs> And the shrapnel. <laughs> um, I, 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 I could not have imagined. It. Then it was really just, it really was just, um, you know, mostly white nerds playing D&D. And the people of color, it was, you know, any, basically anybody, you know, a person of color or femme-presenting individual walking into a gaming store immediately like, 
do you know what you're here for? Do you know what this place is about? And I gave up the hobby I, just because I was like, well, no tables really feel fun or welcoming, so I stopped. And I could not have imagined that, you know, decades, gosh, why am I saying like, I'm, I mean, I, I am old, but why am I saying like that? That, that years later, you know, I would see tables changing. I would see people in the industry changing. I would see other voices being highlighted and then be invited to take part in it again. So it's been a really fun, like even though it was a huge hiatus, it's been a really fun return to the hobby. And it's also been cool when others have told us, like in, our, in person at PAX or via messages that because they saw, you know, they saw rivals in an actual play entirely composed of people of color. Not only that, but also to let people know that you know anyone can play D and D. There were varying levels of experience in the cast. It's it's just been really cool to you know not feel like I inspired anybody, but the fact is that you that visibility made other people realize it's possible, and I just love that. Um, I came from the world of theater. Uh, I was an actor and music director. Uh, I mean, my whole life, certainly my whole adult life. Uh, and that industry has its own struggles with representation and visibility. And um, in the years leading up to the pandemic, I was really, really fortunate um, to sort of have a string of about three, almost four years where I got to bounce back and forth between uh, being an actor and being a music director in shows that were for people of color. Um, I got to do several productions uh, in productions of Evita. Uh, and got to perform as Che, and our casts were really, really uh, race conscious and culture conscious. Um, I did my first one was in Miami, uh, so you know the Pickens were far from slim, and we had a wonderful <laughs> cast of largely Cubans. But what are you going to do? Um, because they're in Argentina, not in yeah, mind. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you can't rid of that in the recording, right? <laughs> Oh. Anyway, um, so that was amazing, uh, and I, I got to do that in several places, and after that, um, or in between that, I was the music director for a beautiful uh, company uh, that did In the Heights, uh, which is the, not actually the first, but uh, the first big famous musical from Lin-Manuel Miranda, who did Hamilton, um, about a community of Latinos in Washington Heights in New York City, and it's a beautiful show, and we had a wonderful cast and company. Um, of actors of color and and creatives of color. And I had just really started to feel like I had found a place in that industry that understood me and that I understood and where I could be my full self and didn't have to sort of squash myself to fit in whatever the room was, whether it was overtly white or overtly straight or overtly whatever, right? Um, and then the world kind of fell apart and theater fell apart real hard. Um, and I found myself sort of flailing to find something that let me do that again, to be sort of my full self. And starting my own podcast, not knowing much about anything in gaming at that point, was just a way for me to take some control and do a thing and, and do it with friends, but feel like I could be my full authentic self. As I began to move into the industry, the gaming industry more professionally, it was, you know, 2018, and we were having all of these conversations, and we were talking about how we really wanted to find ourselves with a seat at the table, and there were people of color and queer people in the industry, but they had really fought to be there, and it was still outside the norm, and we were still sort of working within a very, I don't know, straight white paradigm in the industry. And here we are five years later from there, and that is still very true in a lot of corners of the, not even corners, a lot of areas of the industry. But I think about the things that I have gotten to do, and while I loved getting to do Evita and in the Heights in, in theater, and it was, I mean, it, they were some of the most meaningful experiences of my life, they were very much experiences and productions and work that was about my Latino-ness, which is great, I got to share that. Again. But it was a very specific part of me that I was showcasing. I look at my resume in gaming over the last five years, and I see that too. Some of the work that I did, I can't talk too much about it, but some of the work that I did for Darrington Press was very specifically pulling on my heritage and writing pages and pages and pages of lore about a faction that is, at its core, Mexican, uh, and what that was. But I also got to write about a moonstone dragon in Business Treasure of Dragons, and it has 
well, overtly, that has nothing to do with my loving goodness. But I get to bring my full self and I get to know the stories of my culture and the stories of my family and where I came from and where they all came from, and that informs everything I've ever done. And I think the fact that we have something like this now, in 2023, and we'll continue to have it and more opportunities will continue to come, is what I've been saying since 2018 I wanted, which is not just a seat at the table, but a seat that isn't marked Latino, or a seat that isn't marked queer. Just a seat. And we're still working for it, but I look at what I've gotten to do that gets me up here right now on this stage with these amazing people, and I think, oh, actually, it's getting better. We're getting, I mean, listen, we've got work to do, but it's getting better. And I hope that we five and those who we work with and those who you also know who are out there continue to show that it is possible so that all of you can be a part of it too. Um, so I started playing TTRPGs in college, so 10, over 10 years ago now, which is weird to say. Um, <laughs> It feels like yesterday. Um, and it was definitely like, I was playing with a group of white folks, I was not great. And so then hiatus, played with some other folks, had one other person of color, but not black. And then I started, I started my podcast and it wasn't tabletop. It was just gonna be like, oh yeah, black queer mental wellness. Like, um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about it and all these things. And it was really boring because <laughs> it was me sitting in a recording booth that was because my friend at the time was in college and had access to an actual booth at the college, um, and it was me sitting in a booth talking about stuff alone. And so I very quickly stopped doing it. And then I was like, I like games, I like running games, what if I ran games for black people? And we talked about the game and mental wellness, because then I'd been playing with friends and stuff, and had been experimenting with using tabletop role-playing games in therapy. And so then Woke Mental Wellness went from like an explainer, boring explainers podcast to like, we're black queer people at a table playing a TTRPG and then talking about the mental health themes that come up in the game and how they relate to our lives, which was infinitely more fun and infinitely more interesting a listen. And I'm hoping to do a season three um, of it if I can find the time and the fun. But it's being able to do that, being able to have these things and find people and not be the person sitting alone having uh, you know, a white woman write a poorly veiled blog about how much she hates your character. Um, oh, no. Oh, yes, this was my first TTRPG <laughs> experience. She literally wrote an entire blog about, like, kept a blog about how much she hated my character and what my character was doing uh, that I absolutely found. And so, and so like going from that to having this space, being able to come to uh, PAX and meet all of these people and work on these projects and be like, not only do I not need a seat at those tables, but we now have our own table mm -hmm. tables. That's what I like. I, I like having our own tables. I like having spaces where we're the ones here, we're the ones designing the table, and we're not, we're not just asking for a seat. We're creating the seats and we're changing what the seats are. And that's, that's what I love. Yeah. I love that. That was beautifully said. Um, so, I, as I said earlier, I've only been playing TTRPGs for about like five, six years at this point. Um, before then, I, I was never interested, mostly because every time I saw it portrayed or anybody was talking about it, it always seemed to be oversaturated with just whiteness. And so it felt like a space that wasn't for me. And that's how I feel about like a lot of just high fantasy in general. It's just, it doesn't feel like it's for me, so I never got into it. Um, and then and then Critical Role happened. <laughs> and, and it's not that I got into Critical Role so much as like my friends did. And I found myself on 
the opposite end of a conversation that was being talked <coughs> at me about critical role. And, but that got me interested in, I wanted to understand what this game was because I wanted to relate to my friends. Like, I was like, what are you guys into? I basically did it so I could like have, I could understand what was so fascinating to my friends about this game. And so I had a friend, it was their first time DMing, they offered to start a game uh, so I can just kind of get a feel for it. And I, I fell in love with it. <laughs> it made me do math, but I fell in love with it. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. This is the only time, it's the only time I've ever enjoyed math. <laughs> Give me that, please. Um, math gays do not apply. Um, <laughs> wow. Wow. So I see nice. you. I think she's like around. Fair's mod sword away from that. <laughs> Never. Except unless, unle I mean, it is your channel, so I don't have to say. But, but, so, in playing that game, and uh, like many campaigns, did not last very long. Um, but that got me excited about the game, and that led me to wanting to know, to find, uh, actual plays in spaces where there are black people and, and just people of color who are playing it. And actually, that DM, that friend who DM'd me is actually the one who told me about Rivals of Waterdeep. So then I started listening and slash watching. Um, and then the pandemic hit. Uh, and because I was stuck at home with very little to do besides my work, like during the day, that's when I started going to Twitch and watching the streams and then you know, finding a lot of other creators in the space and sort of just reaching out and networking and just meeting all these fantastic people just by chatting with them. Um, and that has led me to to finding opportunities for myself. Is that better? Am I Somewhat. learning? Am I learning? <laughs> okay. And just, um, you know, it actually gave me the confidence to put myself out there, honestly. Because seeing Rivals of Waterdeep and other um, other actual plays that were melanated people really gave me the confidence to be like, you know, I could do that too. You know, I could be on stream. I could play this game. And then, yeah, I <laughs> I said it before. I'm like, and then things started happening, and I still don't know how I got here. But I mean, I got here on my because of the work that I did. I got here. Because of the work that I did. <laughs> I got here because of the work, the work that I did, and just like I guess my my passion for the game because I do have a lot of passion for playing. Like I love it, um, and that's kind of just led me down to where I am today, which is sitting at a table with people that I enjoy playing with and interacting with every single day, um, and. I do this, I re realized, didn't realize, I've always known it, but to articulate it as something different. Mm -hmm. Like, I do it because I didn't have it, or I didn't have a, as much of it as I would, I would have wanted for myself. And that's how I feel about just media in general. Like, uh, growing up, I would have loved to see more of myself on TV mm -hmm. and in movies. And I, and I never had that. And it wasn't until, like, I think, college when I started questioning these things because you know the world conditions you to just think that's normal to never see yourself and so when I got into this space understanding how white it was and still is to a certain extent made me want to do better for other people so that people in the future can see themselves sitting at a table or being on stage at PAX having a similar conversation about these types of and yeah, like I'm baffled to be here, but happy to be here. <laughs> can I can I be a psych nerd for a second? Yeah. Yes. Um, also, like this dynamic doesn't happen without the expansion of representation mm -hmm. and of us in in uh, in the space mm -hmm. and in these industries, right? Of like having the ability to have three black folks on stage bullying each other <laughs> to I'm gonna be bullied so hard <laughs> in, in, in order to be like nah fam we deserve to be here and I think that's a huge takeaway about all of this mm -hmm. is that 
So much of what we see tells us that we don't belong here. You can't help but have some of that become internalized. Mm -hmm. And that internalized oppression requires direct confrontation mm -hmm. in order to heal. And so also, part of why I love this, part of why I do this, part of why I started Black Liberation Play Day and the Woke Mental Wellness Podcast is that very fact. Because it requires that direct confrontation, but games provide such an amazing opportunity to do that, whether you're on a panel with friends bullying them to be nice to them, <laughs> to remind that they're a boss bitch who deserves to fucking be here. I, I, I saw that one. With a problem, catch <laughs> I saw that hand lift up in <laughs> <laughs> like, Great uh, for everyone. You want to adore all of our banter? Uh -huh. no, we are on a panel. I'll go over there, right? Yes. Um, but I want to I wanna give Brian and Henny a hard time in a loving way. Sure. Oh, yeah, let me leave back. <laughs> yep. What? Oh, 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 like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> See, they're making it weird. <laughs> What's up? So I want to bring up Virgil and Kent. Sure. Oh. Because, you know, we talk about rivals a lot. We've mentioned Motherlands. Mm -hmm. But it's always made me, one, happy that you said yes. I'm not like, no, I'm not going to play the table with you. And B, that... We got to see Virgil and Kent be eventually the power couple of Warner Youth. <laughs> um, but to just see a relationship that was queer and loving and happy and neither of you died. Well, except for what B Dave did, but that's another show. Um, <laughs> that was a really that wasn't well, that's, that's, that's that like that was an AU. That, yeah. that was the <laughs> connection. But I, but I, you know, for me, it was super important, one, because I got to play with my friends and I'm selfish. True. But two, to have both of you have that portrayal of not just being uh, people of color in a, in a relationship that was healthy and happy, but for the representation it gave a lot of people. So within whatever you want to talk about, how was that for you, one, be, being asked to join the show and then in the way that your characters culminated? Sure. I, I want to start, just in case anyone is, and it's, it's okay, you don't have to own up to it, but it's okay if you aren't familiar with Rivals of Waterdeep. So no, it's real, not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So real quick, on Rivals of Waterdeep, uh, Brian and I played uh, Kent and Ver I was uh, Kent and he was Virgil. We were, uh, I played in uh, a tiefling rogue and he was an Azimar sorcerer. Uh, if you're not familiar, tieflings are uh, half infernals and Azimars are half celestials. Uh, we were both uh, uh, male presenting characters who were a couple when we joined the show uh, later on in the series. Uh, and throughout our six seasons, I believe, oh with, I know, with the rivals, uh, <laughs> we got to play around with showing that relationship and how it grew. And as we, uh, as the group gained power in our home city of Waterdeep, the way that our relationship sort of became much more public uh, within the lore of the game. So, just a little bit about what on earth we're talking about if you haven't seen Rebels. <laughs> what? Oh, um, <laughs> I think the, for me, the, you know, as, as amazing as, as amazing as this, okay, now this sounds egotistical, but as amazing <laughs> as the characters that we play are. Um, initially, that was not like that was not really the idea. We were we were just brainstorming like, oh well, I want to play this. What are you going to play? And it sort of was like, okay, well maybe we'll kind of flip our characters. And it was actually Tanya who said, well, what if they're a couple? And then you and I were like, okay, let's, okay, let's go with that. And and just to be able to kind of immediately introduce our characters as such in the show. And everyone's like, every, every other every other character is like, okay, this is this is happening. Um, you two will obviously need a room together, kind of thing. Like there was just, it just flowed well. And what I think I I most enjoyed about as as we learned more, and it's funny because we didn't like building and starting at that high level. Mm -hmm. We didn't really write a ton of background into the characters and we sort of started developing that as we went through and working with each each season's gm to say well okay well what is this in your background what is this like and what was really fun is like they just have a normal good relationship and but also they are like normal queer people like kent's 
relationship with his family is amazing. Virgil's is not. And I mean, it's like, it, I mean, I purposely did that to myself because <laughs> like, it's not a tragic backstory, but it's definitely like, it's not like super happy. But also like that could be normalized, like to be able to, to bring a little bit of that, the experience that a lot of queer people have where like family's complicated. Mm -hmm. A relationship with somebody who gets you is a lot easier, so you tend to focus on that. And yeah, we just, it's, it was just a lot of fun to, to kind of learn more. That's the best experience I have from Rivals is creating a character that really was just a bunch of numbers on paper and like a cool mishmash in my head <laughs> of different archetypes. And over time, watching that become an actual character and, and well-rounded and, you know, like, now I'll be honest, the coolest thing is that, like, we have characters in a video game. Yeah. Uh, they, are, <laughs> they are also husbands in that video game. Yeah, that's pretty and great. And just like, okay, yeah, that's, that's also cool. <laughs> you know, the other thing that I, I loved so much about getting to play her, uh, Cat and Virgil is, is that we got to choose what was highlighted as like, as anything, as important or as special or as we want to make sure that you see yourself in this and representation, but it was, it was what we wanted, right? We were at a table of all folks of color players. And so focusing on the fact that like I was a tiefling from Infernus or from like Infernal background and he was an Azamar and Celestial, that wasn't, that wasn't the interesting thing to us. That's, that is certainly an easy and a, and a, and a reasonable like trope to play with. But that was never, that was never what was interesting to us, and it didn't have to be. It wasn't forced upon us. We weren't asked to talk about that racial disparity. And like, oh, so that's not what we wanted. When we wanted to focus on the fact that we were a, a gay couple in this world, we got to. And we got to partner with uh, Blue Microphones and Logitech for Pride a couple of years ago, and do a really fun little like mini, it wasn't even a one shot, it was kind of like a little storytelling yeah. thing with the two of us. And that was awesome, because we got to say, all right, right now, we want to be that representation of a queer couple, of a happy queer couple. But when we were in the game, if it was relevant, if we wanted that to be a thing for an episode, we would talk about it. But otherwise, it was like you said, we were just happened to be a couple who also were in the same adventuring party. And that was sort of it. And that kind of control and agency, rather than being told, all right, remember, you gotta make sure they know that you're the queer couple. You know? <laughs> you tokenize yourself that, right now. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and not even necessarily always from the outside, right? And I feel this I feel this particularly when I when I write for the bigger publishers that I've had the privilege of working for, is like I have to make sure that everyone knows that I am a, a gay Mexican man <laughs> who, who knows you know, who did that. it feel there is such pressure, right? As pick your marginalization to represent the whole group well, and to always make sure that everyone sees you doing the thing. And Kevin and Virgil were such a blessing of like, yeah, we did that when we wanted to. Mm -hmm. yeah. And otherwise, we got to just live in these bodies and these marginalizations and these whatevers that we live in anyway. It's about having the space to be yourself without having to justify your presence or like be like, well, I'm, I'm Mexican, I, I, I'm queer, I'm black, I'm an ace. It's about not having to sh shuck and jive for the attention, basically. Yeah, you just get yeah. to be you and play how you want to play without having all these qualifiers because, yes, I, I am black and I am from presenting, but that is not... And those, those identities mean a lot to me, but that's also not the whole of who I am. And, and don't let it be. Yeah, I mean, let me preach at you for a minute because we can do it to ourselves so easily. We have panels like this even now, right? And this is joyful and we're talking about wonderful things, but, but we're here because it's a little unusual for us to be here in this combination and whatever. And so it's so easy for us to put that pressure on ourselves to make sure that we are the perfect representation of X, Y, and Z, that whatever I write has a little bit of this in it so that everyone remembers that, yeah, it's important to, to ask people of color to write on your RPG books because they're gonna bring this specific cultural nuance that you don't have with that's so heavy that's yeah. so heavy no nah, dude i just want to move stone dragon yeah. <laughs> i'm good but but truly and, and it is important right and if you have the space for it and if you have the wherewithal to do it in in some situation by all means we we you know we can use it but i that can't be why those of us again like pick your marginalization 
find ourselves in professional settings and getting to do cool things, that can't be the only thing that you have to prove or something, yeah. right? Because then, then you are the token, then you are playing the old game rather than making a new one. And it's interesting because um, my character, Salise, I intentionally made her older. <coughs> mm -hmm. I, and I admit this, because it took me a long time to realize I actually went into the trope of kill your gays with her backstory. <laughs> it wasn't intentional, it was just like, eh, I'll do this thing. But it was why she was a paladin of vengeance. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things where, you, where we're talking about this, where getting to tell your own story is so powerful. Why the hashtag own voices is always on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And you know, that is more about, I think, what romance and sci-fi, but it applies to all forms of media because we do not get to tell our own stories. You know, with Motherlands, we're getting to tell our story. We're getting to tell a story of what it would be like if there was not colonization, there was not slavery in this alternate reality, not Earth. So before we um, open it up briefly for Q&A, mm -hmm. from everyone, you know, aside from what you're doing here at the convention, what are things that you hope people get out of the visibility you have for the weekend and going forward, and ways in which they can actually do the work? Because a lot of people think, well, I, I give you know, five bucks on Patreon, I'm doing my part. And they don't actually do their part, but they think like, oh, I give once a year to whatever charity or, you know, to, to borrow from Cassie. I did my land acknowledgement, I'm good, right? <laughs> um, so this is my call to action, not for us, because I'm just gonna be straight up, we're tired. <laughs> and this is a preview of what you're gonna get at the panel tomorrow with me and Kenny about not having a non-melanated table. And me. And me. Oh, yeah. shit. Well, it's basically all of us. <laughs> <It's laughs> <It's laughs> yeah. We can add you. It's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the call to action is, you know, Walt's program is great and it's awesome that we're here and we're getting visibility and things like that, both at, at all the PAXs eventually. We can't always carry the burden. And as Johanna said, we can't always be, we can't be your pack mules. So going forward, what is the, what is one piece of work you'd like people to take away from this weekend and just the general work that we're all doing? I, I mean, I'll start. And I mean, you, you know, it's not about giving to a charity or giving five bucks to somebody's coffee, but vote with your wallet in this industry and in all industries. Mm -hmm. And that isn't as simple as, you know, buy motherlands or sub to rivals. But it also means if you're gonna buy a new book, check out the credits page. Are there people credited in that book who are queer or not light or uh, any of the things, right? And if there aren't, maybe think about not buying that book. Maybe think, or, or maybe think about, you know, whatever way that you can bring attention to the fact that that isn't enough anymore. And don't, and, 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 I don't wanna say it. Um, know that that little extra bit of effort of checking out the credits page or looking at the website and the about me pictures and all of that is, feels, may feel like a less visible way of doing it than giving to the charity, than giving to the coffee, than showing up for the stream and the charity drive and the this and that, right? It may feel a little less visible, it may feel a little less immediately impactful, but hopefully you're not the only one doing it. There's several of you here right now. <laughs> and tell your friends to do it, right? And encourage other people. You get invited to a game. Check out, the, check out the credits page of the game before you accept the invitation. Say, oh, I don't know that I want to do that particular game because it seems to be a little one note in its designers and its writers and its credited staff and its whatever it is, right? Why don't, why, and then suggest something else. Maybe we do this instead. That for me is more what the voting with your wallet is about. Yeah? Yeah. It's taking the extra time, the extra effort to making sure that what you are consuming, not just on Twitch, not just during charity season, but all the time when you're playing games, what you're consuming, what you're buying, what you're playing, represents the world around us and the world that you want to see and support. I think that's why you all are here in the room now. So, yeah, that's that's mine. Uh, if I could add on to that, um, 
I think just to ensuring that you are doing the work to unlearn any biases you may have, whether they're intentional biases or not, you know, I mean, we talked up here about how we also have to unlearn a lot of things that have been forced upon us, but it is important to, I'm not saying don't enjoy like certain medias or certain like action plays or whatever, but like definitely question like, okay, well, why am I gravitating towards this group of, over maybe a group that has more people of color, more queer per representation and things like that? Well, why do I gravitate to this? over that when they are doing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And I think um, when you start to question yourself, you can and start unlearning all of these things, that will actually help you invest your money and your time and your energy into, into other projects. And to Honey's point, voting with your wallet um, and, and, and taking all these steps to just ensure that there is, as much as you can, like su equal support and, and, and uh, engagement with these works. I'm gonna add, um, mine is learn accountability. Mm -hmm. yes. What it is, how it works, and the compassion needed to engage in it. Mm -hmm. So that we can actually, when you mess up, or your friend messes up, or that person down the street <laughs> who you hate messes up, <laughs> you and they and we as people can engage in a process that actually heals and actually helps. And we don't have to yeet people because they're doubling down on really damaging things. Yes. And that's, that's mine, is doing the work to, if we want to talk about restorative justice, transformative justice in these black and indigenous concepts, we also have to remember that these concepts come in tandem with a communal yeah. mindset. <coughs> And having one without the other is to have neither. Yeah. Yeah. All said really good things. You know, I, I think um, because it, like basically, I, I, you, know, you always have to go first because we're gonna say the same thing. <laughs> Generally, like like leaning in and up leaning, uplifting those um, underrepresented, up, underrepresented um, systems, stories, shows, casts, creators, making those opportunities at your table when necessary, but not not singling them out as the token. And also, you know, in in response to we are tired, mm. so sometimes we do need you to notice that. For instance, someone posted a you know indie RPG creator summit, and it's just like twelve points. Oh my god! <laughs> and we don't just but the thing is, we also need you to understand the way to draw attention to that and, and call it out <laughs> versus just saying, "Ooh, ooh, this is bad," because we will we will address it with nuance, and we need we need those voices to actually kind of listen and learn. So they can say, okay, here's why this is bad. Here are people that you actually could talk to as opposed to just staring at it and go, oh, it seems kind of white, which is a very good drag, not gonna lie. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's also being willing to to kind of learn um, and not put all of not put all of that burden on mm -hmm. on the on your friends in marginalized groups. Yeah. Because yeah, we are we are tired. It's it's every it's it's sometimes every day, all day mm -hmm. for us. And it's really heartwarming when we see our friends who have a modicum or a lot more privilege also being able to, to do it without being a jerk, without talking over us, without being a white knight or a weird ally. And they can also address it and say, here's what's the problem with that. And I, who look like you, am going to tell you what you've done wrong and what you learned from this. <laughs> that is very important because there are like so many times where like, I'll go on to Twitter or something and I see an indie game summit <laughs> that's all white people or, or, or new actual play drops and it's like, all I can do is just sigh because I'm like, I don't have it in me to deal with this right now. Like, I, can't, I can't do this again. Come um, to the panel tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, come to the panel tomorrow. <laughs> but yeah, just like, again, to reiterate, just unlearning, unlearning and learning and being able to advocate when we cannot do so, or just simply do not have the energy to do so, mm. is always a good a step in the right direction. Um, so I'm gonna open it up for questions in our last 15. 
And I'm just gonna throw in the, the caveat, not even the caveat, the addition of, you know, this whole thing about the TTRPG Summit. A lot of people probably are like tagging folks and like, oh my God, aren't you mad at this or what have you. Don't do don't, that. Please don't do that. Oh yeah, don't do that. If we want to engage in a topic like that, we will do so in our own time. Do that because of forcing us to engage in something that might be harmful, ain't it? Treating people, treating minoritized people as your attack dogs is gross. Mm. Stop it. Because <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, I stopped being polite about it. I used to be nice and just reply to DM. Now I'm just going to start posting DMs and go, oh, here's what I got today. Who wants to deal with this? Because it ain't going to be me. Um, so, you know, we can keep talking until we're done, but if there are questions, I think we have a mic somewhere. So yep, yep. Yeah. So if you have questions for our fellows, be respectful, be nice, or I will come down from this table. Hey, you know, just line up in the center aisle, and then yeah, we'll take you as you come. If you can stand, if not, it's sit in the sure yes, thank you. I'm, I'm going to be the friend you're going to pose at. I would like to know one thing that each of you are proud of, the most proud of in the TTRPG space that you've done. Oh. Oh. I know what people want me to say, and that's not going to be it. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'll, I'll say, I'll say it is, it is the, the Moonstone Dragons from Fizzmans, and it isn't because they apparently are by icons, which I've learned in the years since yes. designing them, <laughs> um, but because I took a huge swing with them. Uh, their layers are multi-planar, um, they tend to exist in the ethereal, the Feywild, and the material plane, which is, what a bonkers thing to say. <laughs> Uh, and I kind of wrote it fully expecting the brilliant James Wyatt to send it back to me and be like, try again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he absolutely didn't. He trusted it, and he liked it, and he moved it along, and there are these we And also, they had, we had, been, they had been seen in, in D&D since, I believe, second edition. So there was very little sort of established stuff for me to work off of. And now that's true in D&D, canonically, and I think that's really cool. Actually, you should give Ohenia five dollars for his coffee for that moonstone. Just <laughs> <laughs> um, over. Just <laughs> since you opened your mouth, are you going to answer that? Yes, I, 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 I um, What am I proud of? I'm proud of a lot of the things I've done, um, but I would say something that stands out is just um, being part of Ambistrana. Mm. Um, on top of it being like a mostly. Uh, a BIPOC cast, um, and we're all, I think most of us except for one is, we're all ace except for like one person, <laughs> who we call our tokens, our token straight. Um, I just really enjoyed the character that I've created, Diodora. She's very nuanced and has a lot of layers to her, and like, I'm always learning new things about her as I'm playing the game, and I just like, <laughs> First character I've ever cried over because I thought she had died. <laughs> so like Aww. literally bawling my eyes out on the stream because I thought she was going she actually was dead. Yeah. But then she, she was. got revived. Um I'm just I'm just really proud of that and just the whole cast in general, like it is something that's completely homebrewed, like even with our like classes and the, like the our, our lineages, we're like playing with different things and coming up with new things and we're all collaboratively building this world together, and I just love it. It's my favorite thing. I look forward to playing with them every single weekend. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and then I, if I can throw in another one real quick. Because um, <laughs> I'm like, because <laughs> Ohenia are, are on the Taking Initiative podcast, oh, yeah. and like, Taking Initiative was one of the first actual plays that I ever listened to when I first got into the stream, and so to have kind of come full circle and now be a part of that cast, it's I'm proud of myself for that, yeah. so. <laughs> Brian? Um, Kevin, uh, I don't, like. <coughs> you don't have to I answer. I, I think to. it's, I, I'm like, basically I cry at like anything, so I don't know only talk about stuff like this. <laughs> but uh, watching my own, mm. like, trajectory, mm. uh, yeah, see, now I'm starting to <laughs> but, um, going from player to like co GMs to like writing a homebrew adventure and oh, yes. GMing for people and you know like running a game at like running a game at PAX and it's like that is sometimes mind blowing and it's something that 
it's like a hobby I really thought I would never be involved in. And now, like, I, do we call ourselves professionals? We do. Have it? So, <laughs> we do. Okay, professional. And, um, you know, and I, it, like, the fun that I have, like, it's not, I mean, it's work, but it's also, like, being able to, you know, yes, play the Bay Dragon game, but also lean into playing other systems, making other characters. I keep recalling, like, the first game that Farrah and I were ever in together was that Steel and Knot game. Yes. That was, that was like, amazing. emotionally draining, very sad, very dark. It was so beautiful. And that was amazing. Yeah, like, like, the players came together to create this amazing story, and by the end of it, we're all, like, bawling, because it was not, <laughs> it's not a happy ending kind of story. Yeah. But, um, just to kind of know that this part of this part of myself that you know, like it's I was never gonna be a theater person, but I've been adjacent to it. I kind of dropped it because IT pays better. It just does. <laughs> um, but to be able to kind of pick that up and re-embrace it, and to challenge myself to do new things, even though I am terrified, and that is perfectly <laughs> normal for you to be terrified when you yes. try new things. Yes. Um, and to learn that I'm learning now that you know when I pull something off, I didn't pull it off. I actually did it. I didn't get lucky. I, it, you know, like people actually liked what I did. And and yeah, it's here, here. Yeah. 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 Oh, right. I'm terrified constantly. So. Do you have anything you want to share? Not this one. Um. Okay. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get hated on. So hard right now. Do it. Because I'm having a real hard I'm having a real hard time thinking of anything that I feel like counts. Uh, so uh, really okay, first of all, okay, let, first me first. Okay. <laughs> let me Uno reverse on you. Let me Uno reverse the No, no, take that hat off and say. Yeah, you better shut your face. You better shut your face. It's it's I'm tired, I'm sorry. <laughs> can I do can I can I say something nice about you for a minute? That I don't know if you're proud of it, but like I super appreciate it. I think it was amazing what you did. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yeah. No, so no. Cassie uh, offered their assistance during uh, I think it was the last two seasons of Motherlands, um, in part because they were going to be writing uh, some stuff for the book and some uh, some things that hadn't been shown on screen yet, um, but also because there were a couple of moments in the first couple of seasons where things got really heavy um, and really touched on heavy topics and particularly mental health topics and um, the incomparable uh, Christine Ariel was playing this character who had like a lot of really interesting and really heavy stuff going on with her psyche and this and that and Cassie offered to um, help me both guide the cast through it safely and healthily um, and also started talking to me about other concepts of mental health and, and psychology and sort of non-Western, non-European viewpoints on that. And the enti my entire conception of the way I ran that game and the way we talked about it, particularly with Christina's character, but sort of in general, was turned upside down by the absolutely incredible insight um, from this incredible person who, I, I don't know, and, and I think about it even in like my own life and my own mental health journey and therapy, just the things that you taught me and that I was able to take to that cast, uh, I, I hope you're at least a little proud of that because it made a big difference for me and I think for the whole group. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to say something you haven't proud of. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I did. Yeah, yeah, for I should have figured something out. <laughs> Boy. Boy. Hi. Hi. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. Look, this has now turned into the auntie council. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but we'll also, we only have six minutes left, so, <laughs> so I also want to see if, are there any more questions before we kind of start wrapping up, because we do only have six minutes. Yeah. Thank you for saving me. <laughs> we'll get it later, it's fine. For, um, wow, that's really loud. Yeah. <laughs> for people of color who do feel like they need to show up 110% of the time, mm -hmm. what are things that you do to deal with burnout? Uh, oh. Um, uh, Weed is legal in my state. I don't know, I'm burned down. I, I think it's important to find things that help you decompress from the burnout, even if it's like, it, you just take time for yourself. Like, you don't have to be on all of the time. You can be you, and you should be you most of the time. 
Um, I, I find for me, um, just being able to sort of do something that gives me joy helps me deal with the burnout. Uh, lately, that's been Baldur's Gate because um, mm -hmm. that's where my brain rot is. Um, but like, just finding finding other hobbies that you can get enjoyment out of that has nothing to do with like you needing to be on. I find that that helps me. This one I can do. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> burnout is systemic. It is not a personal problem. If you are burnt out, it means that you've been failed by the environment and systems around you. Uh, so first of all, that piece. Uh, hold to task the communities of care that do not exist and are supposed to be supporting you. Um, two, like, give yourself the space to one, do nothing. Mm -hmm. And then find your people. Like, having people like this that I feel comfortable being like, I can't think of anything because I'm discounting all of it, is really important mm -hmm. because Again, internalized oppression hits hard, and a lot of times it hits hardest when you're doing the best and the most. So when, it, when you notice yourself burning out, when you notice yourself getting tired, say no, find your people. Do what you need and have people that will help hold you to task to do that, and then Build that community to hold the task, whatever systems are failing you that have allowed burnout to happen, whether it's through pressuring you to somehow find an extra 10% because only 100 exists, um, <laughs> and then going there. Yeah. Setting boundaries is important, and your boundaries can change. Like, that's not a problem, but like, knowing what you need in the moment will help you. And my non facetious answer. <laughs> Is it is more than okay to disengage. Mm -hmm. Log out of whatever social media, close the tab, go in a whole other room if you can, because what I'll do is I stream. I go in the living room and I play games. I don't look at my computer, I get off Twitter, what have you, get out of Discord. And it's also very fine and you should learn to say just no. No is a whole answer. Mm -hmm. And there are people that expect too much of you because I am the only black person on my team at work. And there are days when I just go, nah, you're not getting this out of me today. Because it is fine, you are not a pack mule, none of us are. And it's fine to disengage and just go, you know what, I've had enough of Twitter, of everyone, don't answer your phone. Maybe tell one or two people, I'm checking out for the weekend, I'm fine, I just need to not be online. And that is more than okay. And if people give you a hard time, Go, here's my PayPal. Yeah. <laughs> you want you want 110%, pay me 150%. And that's fine. That is perfectly fine. That's why I love people don't like me and I don't care. <laughs> Part of that too, right, of the taking, going away, taking time out. I think for me, what I've learned in the last couple of years is like, that also has to be a zooming out again. We get so in whatever it is that we're doing, whatever it is that we're working on, whatever that 110% is going for, whether it is a particular project or just work, right? And for me, it is so easy for me to forget that the rest of the world exists and continues to turn and, and does all of the things. And so I go outside and I see people living their lives and they have no idea what I was just struggling with. And that's... <laughs> Great. <laughs> and it, it just, it does not make the things that we push ourselves 110% for less important, but it does give us a little bit of perspective, and hopefully will help remind yourself that you can't do it all by yourself. You're not going to. We feel like we want to, we think we maybe can, we narrow the scope of what we're doing so that, well, no, I can't in this, but I can in this. It is not upon any one of us. It cannot be. That's just not, there's just eight billion of us out there. <laughs> and so I take some time outside and I remember the rest of the world and I get a little bit of perspective and I think, you know what? I'm gonna take this weekend off and I'm gonna remember my partner, I'm gonna remember the, the dog we <laughs> dog sit and that's all I'm gonna worry about and I'm gonna remember that that part of life is important and valuable and here. And that's a perfect wrap for oh, our panel. Look at you. Yeah.
Just what are what are you up to the rest of the weekend, PTI fellows? Uh, yeah, so I've been no I am fair and I am fair. <laughs> um, the rest of the weekend you can find me. Um, I'm running another game tomorrow in the the PTI lounge. I can't remember the time, so sorry. Um, and then I will I'm going to be on the how to stop having a non melanated table panel. And I'm also going to be, uh, I said that I never contributed to Into the Motherlands, and that's going to change tomorrow because I'm going to be in the live show. Um, I have the How to Not Be on Melon, How to Have a Melanated Table panel, uh, the uh, Fight Me You, Fight Me You Cowards Now Kiss panel, the Yeah Boy. Okay, I'm proud of that name. Yeah, okay. There we go. Um, and then I'm on Wrong Answers Only because I'm a gremlin and chaos. And then Sunday I am running a game of Dread uh, that you can uh, sign up for. <laughs> so yeah, because horror is my bag. So come let me kill your characters. Uh, I've got tomorrow a couple of games of Betrayal at House on the Hill. Uh, we're going to be playing with my legacy board. Uh, I finished the legacy game, so there's a unique set of house tiles uh, that you won't get anywhere else. Uh, so I'm running that twice tomorrow. I think the first one's at 10.30 and the other one is at some point in the afternoon. Uh, I am on the, non the no non-melanated tables panel as well with these folks and doing the Motherland show tomorrow evening. And then on Sunday, I am running uh, an adventure from Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel uh, for D&D. Um, it is an adventure that I ran for some brilliant uh, folks from Critical Role that we put up on YouTube a while back. Uh, it is Mario Ortegon's brilliant and beautiful Fiend of Hollow Mine. Uh, and I believe we get going at 12.45 or 1 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, you can sign up for all those things on, on the app. Allegedly. Allegedly. Um, <laughs> uh, tomorrow I am uh, in the in the Packs Together Intersection Lounge running Thirsty Star Lesbians at 11.30? Wait, 11.30 I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then other lines tomorrow. What's that? 11.30. Oh, 11.30, um, which, well, <laughs> The time's yes. 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 Be there at so 11.15. Be there at 11.15. <laughs> um, and I'll probably be there with lots of anxiety. And then tomorrow night uh, is Into the Motherlands. Um, that's going to be a lot of fun uh, playing for the second time. And then on Sunday, I decided that while RPGs are a great way to, you know, um, to basically lose friends, I've gone back to the old school <laughs> method of losing friends, which is we're going to play card games and board games. So oh, I was going to say, like, Trouble, like, Sorry, Uno. Uno. No house rules allowed. Um, <laughs> and uh, Dixon. And those are also going to be in the PTI intersection lounge on Sunday. All right, and we're actually over time, so that's it. I'm done. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.